I'm James Freeman. I work for Kuru. I've got a couple of our other guys sitting at the back. You'll be hearing from Wally later this afternoon as well, another colleague of mine. And I'm here today to run through a live demo of migration, well, not just migration, but live replication of data from Oracle to Postgres. We're going to use um, Postgres Advanced Server Enterprise DB's product here. Would work with Postgres Community Edition as well, so you'd have that, both options. Now, Mark's gone through some detail on replication scenarios, why you do this. Before I actually go into doing any demonstration, does anybody have any questions about that? Do you want me to cover any more about scenarios, why you would want to do this, or are we all happy with that? Right. I'll press on then. OK, what we've got running on the screen here, this is a virtual machine running on my laptop. This is ordinary Red Hat Enterprise Linux 6. It is running a number of things. There's an Oracle 11G database on here. I picked 11G because I'm familiar with that. There's no particular other reason than that. Um, we were talking about compatibility earlier. There's no reason this wouldn't work with 12C. There's no reason this wouldn't work with 10G either. Now, as well as Oracle on here, I've got the full Enterprise DB suite of products. So I've got Postgres Enterprise Manager, the Oracle Compatibility Layer, the XDB Replication. So, and what we're going to be working with today is the HR database, Oracle Sample database that ships or that they, they provide as part of their tool set. It's a simple little database. Um, for the sake of demo today, it'll do just nicely. I don't particularly want to get into anything too in-depth or heavy, but what you have to imagine is this is something that you could scale up to a much more complex example um, scenario. So let's just give Oracle SQL Developer a minute to start up. Right, OK. I just want to show you very quickly the data that we're going to be working with so that it um, gives you a little bit of context and hopefully the rest of the demo will make good sense. So what we've got here, the HR database owned by the HR user. Very simple, there's only, what, six, seven tables to it. It's basically tables with example employee data in it, departments within the company, that kind of thing. It's pre-populated with data, so it's great to work with as an example. Some of these columns cross-reference other tables in this schema. So this table, this is the main one we'll be working with departments one today. So manager ID, that's, that is linked to the primary key in the employees table, so that's the manager's employee identity in the database. Location ID links to locations, which links through to countries, regions, that kind of thing. So there's some nice links, there's some opportunities for joins in the databases here. It's not just a sort of a very simple one table example. Try to add a little bit more interest to it than that. Anyway, without further ado, so, and just to add what hopefully is a little real worldish kind of example to it, I've written this is PeopleSoft Lite. No, this is um, <laughs> this is just a little PHP application. It's using the Oracle OCI layer to connect to the Oracle database. All it's doing is querying the departments table. Um, it's not HTML5 or Ajax or anything very Web 2.0, but you can delete records. You can add records to it. So think of this as a simple example application that you might have, for example. Okay. These are the behind the scenes. We can go to the code if anybody's interested, but the, the manager name, the countries, I've done left joins and joins to pull all those out the other tables. So you can see all that's going on. And then what we've got here is something that won't work. It's a reporting application. So the idea is we're going to do live migration and replication to Enterprise DB for reporting purposes. So this is one of the examples you might want to do this. Take load off your Oracle server. Say your Oracle server is fairly heavily loaded. You want to do reporting on another server. You don't want to pay Oracle another however many million pounds for another server. So you can offload some of the load onto Enterprise DB, which is much cheaper, using the Enterprise DB toolset. So by the end of the demo, we'll have this page working. But the fact it doesn't work at the moment is we've got an empty database, nothing in it at all. Right. Now, what do we want to do next? 
Some of this is going to require a little delving into the command line, but there's nothing particularly horrendous or complex here. So setting up the replication is a pretty straightforward process. It, um, there's one or two things to get your head around. Some of it is just terminology, as Mark was going through in his slides. There's nothing particularly horrendous. Now, the first thing you need to do when you install the XDB tools, excuse me, sorry, from Enterprise DB, you get a nice little graphical console which will come up just here. So everything is configured through this graphical console. You can monitor the replication through this as well, so that's nice and straightforward. The only thing that you have to do, particularly if you're working with Oracle, is there's licensing restrictions, Enterprise DB, correct if I'm wrong, Mark, can't ship the OJDBC jar file that would be needed for connectivity to Oracle, so you have to download that from oracle.com and copy that into the libraries directory. That's, that's the only step that is of any complexity in the installation of this. The rest of it is all GUI driven, it's, it looks like a... I shudder to use the word Windows, but a Windows installer, wizard, next, next, next. So it's all straightforward. Anyway, right, the first thing we're going to do to set replication up is rather than use any of the existing users, we'll set up a user on Oracle dedicated to the replication purpose. So security reasons, you want to probably keep that separate. And I'll show you what I'm going to do. Go into the Oracle user. Now, I'm just going to run this SQL script here. Again, I won't need to go into any huge amount of detail, but all we're going to do is basically create a user specifically for publication. We're going to give it rights to connect. The only thing this user needs, the only slightly, don't use the word intrusive, but the only thing it needs is the ability to create triggers because the triggers are what make the replication work behind the scenes. But actually, when it comes to the existing tables, all you're doing is granting selects on the existing <coughs> table. There's no updates, there's no deletes, there's no other right privileges. So this user is pretty secure. There's not too much risk to it at all. So our first thing to do is just We'll run that through, and that's just get set all those grants, created a publication user that we can subscribe to. And then over in our console here, you've got multi-master replication is enterprise DB to enterprise DB only, so we're going to have to go with single master replication. So we'll add a database, Oracle. That's our host name, standard Oracle port. Username is the username that was in that SQL script I just set up. Similarly, the password. And SID, that's already set and well known. So that succeeded. We'll save that. All done. There it is. Now, once the database entry is defined in the console, you need to actually create a publication. This is what's actually going to handle the mi migration and the synchronization of data across to the other side. So we're going to create publication. You can see it's working away there. It's querying the database. Give it a couple of seconds. And there we go. So there's all our HR tables. Now. What it's doing behind the scenes, I haven't sort of gone into great depth at analysing that, but basically if you don't grant the selects on the tables, they won't appear in this publication list. So if you forget that step, you'll find you've got tables missing. But we'll come on to filtering later. At the moment, all we're going to do is select all the tables, give the publication a name, let it do its thing. There we go. And that's it. That is the Oracle side of the replication done. It's as straightforward as that. Now, next thing we have to do is some preparations on the Enterprise DB or the Postgres server. Again, these are about as simple as they are on the Oracle server. So I'm going to use, could do it at the command line if you wanted to. I'm going to load up Postgres Enterprise Manager because I happen to have that installed as part of the suite.
So this is my enterprise DB server over here. And there's only two things you need to do to get this database ready to receive data from the um, XDB product. You need a new login role dedicated to the, the purpose subscribing. Now, Now this does need to be a super user because this user's got to create tables, schemas, things like that when it pulls the data across, particularly the initial replication. Um, the other thing you have to have is modify catalog directly. That privilege needs to be set. We'll do that. All done. And then you're going to create a database to put your data into. So new database, we'll call it HR for sake of simplicity. Set the owner to our new user, so he's got all the rights on it. OK. And there we are. So you can see at the moment that's got one schema in it, the public schema. That won't have any, there's no tables in it, no data in it. But that's it. That's now Enterprise DB all ready to go to receive data. So back in the replication console, subscription server. We'll add a database, so this is just like we did with Oracle. We're going to pick Postgres plus Advanced Server because that's what I'm working with here. So again, standard port. So there's our database definition done. Now, just as we created a publication earlier, we have to create a subscription. So give it a name. Now, the publication server information, this is where your publication server that's part of your XDB install runs. XDB is quite modular, so you can, if you needed to, you can have the console, the publication server, and the subscription server all running on three separate machines if you wanted to, if your architecture mandated a need for that. I've got them all running on the same machine here. But, so this is the, the port that the publication server is running on and the Postgres user, which is, you install it linked to the Postgres user. So if we've got all that right, which I haven't, let's just change the host name. I may have got that wrong. There we go. Okay. Type in my host name. Anyway, that you can see now it's pulled across the publication that we created earlier. So we'll create that. Job done. So there's all our tables mapped across. Now, two last things to do before the data is replicating. Nothing has actually transferred across yet. These are just definitions we've put into the console. So before you do any synchronization, you need to do a snapshot. Snapshot basically takes the Oracle database as it is now and transfers it all across. <laughs> so you've got a starting point. Once you've done your snapshot, you'll set up synchronization. You can configure a schedule. We'll go through that in just a minute. So we'll run snapshot. You'll get a load of debug messages in the console there. But hopefully all will go through just fine. There we go. So that's it. All our rows are now transferred across. Yes, sir? Presumably, you can't have any users in the system between snapshot and synchronization. I. Now, that's an interesting question. I need to. I may need to defer to some of my Enterprise DB colleagues there. But I think because. Sorry, gents. That's fine. That's fine, Mark. <laughs> I mean, my, my understanding is because you're creating triggers that are working with the data, once you've taken the snapshot, the system should be aware of any changes that have been made by users in the database. But, Mark, does that sound right to you? Between snapshotting and setting up synchronization, 
would any changes made during that time be lost? Let me think. Let me think. I mean, I'll tell you what we can do. We can test this live here if you want. That would be an interesting exercise, wouldn't it? We've got the capabilities. We have the technology. So what we can do, we've done a snapshot and we've not done a synchronize right now. So what you'll see over here... Sorry? You wouldn't, you wouldn't see the new data. If you're on a 24 7 system... If you've done your snapshot... Try it anyway. Right we, we, we shall try it. I, I'm interested to see this myself now. So we, we're experimenting live here in this workshop, which is fantastic. Right. Anyway, my reporting application is now working, as you can see. You've got all the department IDs down to 270, which matches what we've got over here. So what we'll do is we've done a snapshot, no synchronization. We're going to create department number 280 for what we could do. Sales. I'll leave those as their defaults for now. So we're just going to add that to the database. You can see that's already added. Now we go to the report, and obviously that's not going to be there. Now, if we go back to the replication console, what we're going to do now is we will manually synchronize. That's done. And refresh this. And there you go, no data has been lost. Is it there? It's there, yeah, 280 has come across. I, that, I believe, is a good analogy of how it works, yes, because the. We'll have a look at the schedule, the setting up of the schedule for synchronization. It's not true real time synchronization, not like a log shipping or, or synchronous um, piece of technology. So what would happen is once you've done your snapshot, you synchronize, you're going to go and configure a schedule. So synchronize, you don't want to be doing snapshots repeatedly. That would probably be a bad. There are scenarios where you might want to do that. But. So I presume if you look in that publish scheme, the new scheme you created on, on Ultimate, there'll be a set of tables there effectively human tables. Yeah. Yeah, that's my um, that's my understanding of how it works. I, yeah, there, I'm sure there probably is technical detail on how it works behind the scenes. I don't know that off the top of my head, but I'm sure we can get it. Um, anyway, yeah, we can set up a schedule for synchronization. There's now, I mean, if you didn't want to do it that frequently to reduce load on the database, or for whatever reason, you could do it daily, weekly, monthly. Particularly if it's reporting runs, you might want to do that. Continuously is what we'll work with here, particularly as we work in a short time frame. So repeat interval is 10 seconds. So it's where you, know, you could turn that down. So we're not talking real time, but we're talking the lag is going to be very small between the reporting database and the master. So it's not a base, it's a pull. It's a... Yeah, I guess you call it a pull. I mean, it's all been handled by XDB. Oh, sorry. Yeah. It's not, it's, not, it's not a trigger that actually ships it. It's not. No, the trigger isn't shipping it. The trigger, I, I think our understanding is, is it's queuing the data to be transferred, and then XDB is handling the polling and the moving of the data itself. And, and so therefore, would, would the queue have to be sized? I am now officially out of my depth. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I, I think that's a fantastic question for Mark or someone like that. So we have, we, we've established that your data is going into a queue somewhere on the Oracle side because it's aware of what's changed between the snapshot and the synchronization, between synchronizations. That data or record of what's changed, how big is the store for that? It, you know, how much can change before you're going to end up with problems? That was paraphrase of the question, I believe. It's going to be just the change vectors the same size as written in the WAL files, just like redo has undo. Um, so it shouldn't be a full data size, it should just be a replicated change vector. So mm. it should be limited. I think it's exactly the same size, but with any more change in it, and the frequency of the So I'm going to go to the tools to. 
query the staging tables and create the case of any data issues, any corrupt data that gets transferred into those tables that prevents the replication performing as it should. I I don't believe so. I think it um I'm trying to think what sort of scenarios you could see there. I mean, I, I think as long as, it, you know, it's working at a SQL level. So if, the, if Oracle understands the data well enough to be, for it to be written to its own database and committed, then it obviously oh, it'll be yeah, replicated. I understand, but say, say there's a, a network issue, and probably not so much on this, when we're on the same machine, but there could be a mm. network issue causing a, um, a failure to be able to replicate the data in the same process. Um, mm. and occasion, but you do get the tools to either ignore a batch, replay a batch, or you can pull out a SQL format batch and run that manually to, and then purge the, uh, the queues. Yeah. So are there yeah. tools to manage the, the queue if need be? I, I haven't seen anything of it actually as part of this console. I, I Again, I'm going to defer to my colleagues at the back, I'm afraid. <laughs> I think that's a good plan. Yeah, we'll get a, a, a more in depth answer. <laughs> yeah, I think let's. Um, we'll have to get these questions answered, sent out afterwards. What happens if you make changes to the structure of the My, let's have a quick look at this. I don't believe that this replication is going to handle changes to the, the structure of the tables. My understanding is it, we're just replicating data from within those tables. Um, again, I think let's, we'll just confirm that offline and get that back to you. Um, but I, I think this is, this is pure replication of the existing schema as it is. Is that right, Mark? Oh, we <laughs> if someone changes the structure of the tables on the master, are they changes replicated? The DDL shouldn't be changed, um, and you have to replicate that yourself. So, again, it's just one of the things which is interesting. If you know if you're going to be changing the tables, then you generally have to replicate that change. Of course, you run another snapshot. Yeah. You could do that, yeah, absolutely. You change the DDL, both those. I mean, the, there's nothing wrong with running more than one snap shot operation it's, it's just it's a heavyweight operation you know it, it is a dump one better word of all the data on the master database across to your subscription database so yes so now you can't as I understand it Correct me if I'm wrong, Mark. You can't select specific columns from the tables to replicate. So it, it will replicate the tables one to one in terms of the column structure. Can you do a, can you but do a transform if that's part of replication. You you can filter. Um, so uh, to answer part of your question, you can se selectively replicate data so only new records go through or something like that. You can't actually that this isn't. There's no transform logic in this. So it's. Um, it's kind of all or nothing with regards to columns, and the the, the data is translated. Not, well, it's not translated. That's the point. It, it is sent across as is. Um, the one thing you can do. So, if we were to look at departments table, which is the one we're we're primarily working with here, the one thing you can do is update this filter clause. So. For example, we could say here, I mean, pick your example, but say you only wanted, you know, you know that's your existing set of departments. You only want to replicate the new stuff across. So you could, you would do department ID greater than, <coughs> let's say 300, for example. So we can do that. Now that's not going to affect any of the historic replication that's happened. So our department oops, number 280, which we did earlier, will always remain in the database because that was already replicated. But what will happen is we can add a couple more. So we'll add a 
299 just for an example pre-sales and a 301 support like that and then we'll give it time to replicate because there's a 10 second lag so you can see at the moment it hasn't caught up with it but there we are so now you can see 301's replicated 299 hasn't so you've got that kind of capability to to at least uh, and that, those that filter expression is basically the it, it is what you'll put in the where clause in a SQL query so no no carry on I do do you know that mark? I I would have thought it would have worked, yeah. Um I uh, just curious because we've got time here at the moment. What is the time? Ten forty eight. So you could use that as an in effect way to do your transform, you obviously need to transform first on within the Oracle database before you replicate to, to Postgres. Yeah, now I mean, we, we, we've got a view in the HR database. I'm just curious about whether we can... So this didn't show up, but then I never granted select to this, so I'm interested to see if we... So if we grant... Yeah, is that standard on materials you have? Ah, that's a good point. Don't know. Um, no, it's not. It's a standard view. You're absolutely right. No, I haven't got any materialised views to work with, so that's a fair question. Um, should work... I mean, we can we can certainly. Well, that must probably be a case thing then. Um, hold on. Let's try that. Okay, yeah, that works. All right. So if that's going to work, we should be able to go back here. Let's see, add tables. Let's see if it comes up with anything. No, interesting. Okay. So we'll um, we'll get the guys add that to the questions and make sure we we get a, a proper answer technical answer back to that but it looks like um, I mean that didn't work here so yeah uh, absolutely so may, may work with yeah yeah we'll um, we'll defer and uh, we'll, we'll get you answer back to that one yes, yes. I'm kind of on about this, but, uh, no no <laughs> it's fine <laughs> we have a, a fairly chunky database relatively to the rest of the world, mm. um, which is quite dynamic in that the developers are constantly making changes to the code structure and so on. Yeah. If we replicated that, mm -hmm. a, if they make a change to table structure, is it going to break the entire replication or that data just won't replicate over? And then, and then B, if a single table is changed, would I have to run a snapshot of the entire database or the entire publication, or could I just snapshot that single table? Everything else would carry on replicating quite happily, snapshot that table, and then away we go. Or would I have to transfer the entire publication over, which would be a, a bigger piece of work, I, I guess? Uh, well, not so much work, but it would be Well, in terms of workload for servers, I mean, yeah, yeah. Now I am. Um, I'm just having a play here. 
you can only, the snapshot option in the console is only available from the actual um, subscription object itself. So that, it looks like that will only run on the entire publication. Which uh, added one column to one table, you would have to <coughs> potentially, but one thing to to bear in mind is that I've I've done this very simply as all the tables under one publication. Now XDB isn't licensed per publication or um, subscription server. That you know, there's no limitation like that. So you. You'd have to decide how you want to split it out, but you, you know, particularly if you know certain a certain table or certain target tables that are like more likely to change than others, you would put them under separate publications. Then you just snapshot that publication rather than the entire lot. I mean, as far as the end database, yeah. So that that's one way you could get around that. Um, I mean, in terms of Mark, do you know if if the table structure changes? under XDB, uh, does synchronization carry on for the table that's changed or does it b break? It would break it. I mean, yeah. Again, an answer from a marketing person could be sacking your people to tell you to change. You're going to have to do a bit more planning to break it. And then what about foreign keys in the Postgres database? If you split it up into multiple publications, and we had foreign keys going parent-child relationships across publications. That's something you have to think about as well. It's, it's not an easy design, but it, you know, the, the question is why are we doing this? If you're right in the sense of, if you're reading literature out there, it talks about the fact that you can't migrate foreign and primary keys. You can, but where people have fallen over is because they try to do it in two snapshots. <coughs> of course, you get the problem. So again, another way around that, potentially, you know the data source is coming from is true, so you could say, don't replicate, um, or don't have a primary key foreign key, the way, just create them afterwards. So it depends on how you want to do it. Ideally, you don't want to do that way, but some people are happy to do that. Okay. The, other, the other question um, I've just checked it here is the, the, the shadow database that are created for replication. Um, if there is a failure, it will wait, or no, it didn't get across, and then carry on afterwards when the network's back. And that's just an automatic part of the shadow. Once it's gone and completed, it gets a completion flag. If it hasn't gone, it's not completed. He knows he's going to do it next time. One thing I would suggest to you is Kuru, uh, our, our apartment of enterprise leader, are based in London, and we can do a workshop. So if you want, we can do a hands on, one to one workshop. We can take a scheme of the database and we can actually spend a few hours just going through exactly how things work. Yeah, I mean, we. we you know, we'd be more than happy to. We we can break things. We can add columns. We we can simulate whatever scenarios you want to do. Um, you know, there's uh, I don't know what people's appetite is for me to break things here, but um, you know, yeah, we can absolutely do that. Yeah, that's a good point. Now the subscription server. Let me find the right tab. There's also some monitoring here in the console, so you can see there's my replication history. You can see that happening every 10 seconds to tell you how long the replication is taking to happen. You can see the number of rep records that have gone across, so there's my snapshot. There's one of the updates I did. Some of the others will be buried in here. Obviously, there's a lot of records with it happening every 10 seconds, but you can, uh, at least you can get a report on what's happening, what's working. Filter so that out. It, there is. It, it's more of a. a I think a poll, polling is probably the better description. So there is under this console. There's a separate publication subscription server running. So the publication server is going off and polling the Oracle database in this case, and then it's passing the data across to the subscription service, which so is then... Would you get, say, in that lot, would you get a message saying remote database is unavailable? Yeah, yeah, it'll, it'll flag errors. Um, so we can, again, fun things you can do.
you wouldn't do this for real, but you know, <laughs> you can kill your Postgres database. So we'll um, give it 10 seconds and see what happens. How did you kill it? Well, I, I used the init script, I shot it down cleanly, but yeah. kill minus nine. <laughs> <laughs> and the reason I say that, just be careful with film on this time because if it's not a tidy cleaner, it can leave rogue processes around. So users actually could stay connected as well because they've got their own server process. So kill minus nine is a very, very, very last resort. Mm. Not that you're getting consistent data, it just means you'll have users still around. I mean that that's now broken, so it seems to be down, as far as we can tell. Now that is interesting. I used the correct script to shut it down. According to this, it's still replicating. Your Windows? Uh, no, Linux. <laughs> There's an interesting one. <laughs> the reason I say that is because in Windows, you have to use the, uh, the service down. You can't use the standard Postgres files. You can't use them. PPAS-9.3 but there is Postgres running on this box as well which is confusing so <laughs> it, 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 it's so good it'll work when your server's dead yeah it's, it's just that good <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> I think we'll put that down to that didn't shut down clearly. <laughs> anyway, right. Let me see if we can start that up at least. Yeah, okay, so it's back. But yeah, it would report, you know, it's just as it's reporting successful synchronizations, it would report, I, I failed, basically. Um, somewhere in there. It's writing out log files to the file system as well, so there's the scope to scrape them if you need to. There's other ways you can get at the data. If replication fails for one table, as you said, you make the PDL change, mm. will that stop all the replication within that uh, one of the publication group? Ooh, now that's a good question. I... Mark, if... <laughs> <laughs> Did, do you need me to repeat the question, or are you? No, no, I, I, it's, it's, it's horrible when, when you don't know the answer, but because there's so many permutations of things that could. I don't come across people who've done that, but I know it happens, and it's I'm just not come across it. So the database, uh, again, this is going back to the question I had earlier. Realistically, you don't want it to happen because you could have an unsyn, you could have a, an unsynchronized data, and you're getting, you know, you're getting inconsistent data on your replication stream. So you really want it to stop. So my, my heart tells me it's going to stop uh, because it should stop because the fact that one table changed should, uh, and that should break it would mean that it would fall errors and wouldn't see. So I'm going with that <coughs> and uh, Kuru will come on site and I'm proving right. Yeah. Who will be right? I think so, yes. Again, Sakura did you. Well, yeah. <laughs> I think, I mean, I, I can spend all day playing with this and trying to break it and do things. <laughs> um, that's, that's how many sides I think, James, you've got nothing else to do but play with this. I like it. I like breaking things, that's my job. <laughs> I mean, that is, we are, we are ahead of time on the schedule. Uh, we, that, I, that is everything that I had prepared to show you on the replication of PPAS. Is there anything that anybody else wants to cover or ask or go through? So what's the relationship between Kuru and uh, Enterprise DB? Do you both perform the same functions? Do you work collaboratively together? So we are part... Please. We, we are effectively a strategic partner of those in the UK. So we're a, a Red Hat friendly partner for a consulting business for software development now, two um, DBAs. So we work to help customers 
We used to do a lot of work with IBM in terms of developing IBM for Postgres <coughs> and Power and various other things, but we're very tight about it in the UK. So when, when you mentioned you would perform the assessments, yeah. to the task, you know, but Mark, yeah. you also mentioned yeah. that as well. So. We, yeah. Yeah. We were collaboration. Yeah. yeah. Okay. What, what, we, we, we were still a growing company, we had 150 worldwide uh, plus, and so we offer a service called Oracle Migration Assessment. Um, and we would work with you to say, right, this is what we think these databases could come across and not. Um, and then what we would probably say is, um, you know, we can do the report for you, we can tell you if you don't. And we could provide the service where we can actually help you with migration, but we can also um, work with Kuru, because um, they've got men on the ground, or people on the ground, sorry, uh, where they can do yeah. it. <laughs> I know they're all men, they're It could be even James, I might have probably been there. Um, but, um, yeah, so we work with Kuru because we know that it's a large, a, a large um, uh, job. We could possibly be on site for a couple of years, but they are UK local based and they can do it as well. I presume on the uh, Postgres side, you can create additional triggers on the tables that we replicate to some kind without interfering with the replication. Yeah, I don't see why you couldn't, yeah. Yeah, I mean, once the, the data's in there, you could do, I mean, you could do nasty things and delete rows and, uh, you know. It's a database link, so you could do anything. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, you know. Yeah. Yeah, yeah well, yeah. <laughs> That's what we usually call for. Excuse me. <laughs> right. The we do most now. There are there is a document. I think Wally's going to go through some more detail this afternoon when he talks about the migration. There are some limitations to data types that you can both migrate and replicate functions, things like that. Um, I've chosen to work with the Enterprise DB product here because it is um, Oracle compatible. So it does support most of the data types. What was your, have you finished all my I, uh, Yeah, I mean, I, I'm, I'm done with the demo unless anybody wants to see anything else. So.